What was left then was my true nature as the ever-present I am. Consciousness in its pure state prior to identification with form. Later I also learned to go into that inner timeless and deathless realm that I had originally perceived as a void and remain fully conscious. I dwelt in states of such indescribable bliss and sacredness that even the original experience I just described pales in comparison. A time came when, for a while, I was left with nothing on the physical plane. I had no relationships, no job, no home, no socially defined identity. I spent almost two years sitting on park benches in a state of the most intense joy. But even the most beautiful experiences come and go. More fundamental, perhaps, than any experience is the undercurrent of peace that has never left me since then. Sometimes it is very strong, almost palpable, and others can feel it too. At other times it is somewhere in the background, like a distant melody. Later, people would occasionally come up to me and say, I want what you have. Can you give it to me or show me how to get it? And I would say, You have it already. You just can't feel it because your mind is making too much noise. That answer later grew into the book that you are listening to now. Before I knew it, I had an external identity again. I had become a spiritual teacher. This book represents the essence of my work as far as it can be conveyed in words with individuals and small groups of spiritual seekers during the past 10 years in Europe and in North America. In deep love and appreciation, I would like to thank those exceptional people for their courage, their willingness to embrace inner change, their challenging questions and their readiness to listen. This book would not have come into existence without them. They belong to what is as yet a small but fortunately growing minority of spiritual pioneers. People who are reaching a point where they become capable of breaking out of inherited collective mind patterns that have kept humans in bondage to suffering for eons. I trust that this book will find its way to those who are ready for such radical inner transformation and so act as a catalyst for it. I also hope that it will reach many others who will find its content worthy of consideration, although they may not be ready to fully live or practice it. It is possible that at a later time, the seed that was sown when listening to this book will merge with the seed of enlightenment that each human being carries within, and suddenly that seed will sprout and come alive within them. The book in its present form originated often spontaneously, in response to questions asked by individuals in seminars, meditation classes and private counseling sessions, and so I have kept the question and answer format. I learned and received as much in those classes and sessions as the questioners. Some of the questions and answers I wrote down almost verbatim. Others are generic which is to say I combined certain types of questions that were frequently asked into one and extracted the essence from different answers to form one generic answer. I use words such as mind, happiness and consciousness in ways that do not necessarily correlate with other teachings. Don't get attached to any words. They are only stepping stones to be left behind as quickly as possible. When I occasionally quote the words of Jesus or the Buddha, from a course in miracles or from other teachings, I do so not in order to compare, but to draw your attention to the fact that in essence, there is and always has been only one spiritual teaching, although it comes in many forms. Some of these forms, such as the ancient religions, have become so overlaid with extraneous matter that their spiritual essence has become almost completely obscured by it. To a large extent, therefore, their deeper meaning is no longer recognized and their transformative power lost. When I quote from the ancient religions or other teachings, it is to reveal their deeper meaning and thereby restore their transformative power. Particularly for those listeners 
who are followers of these religions or teachings. I say to them, there's no need to go elsewhere for the truth. Let me show you how to go more deeply into what you already have. Mostly, however, I have endeavored to use terminology that is as neutral as possible in order to reach a wide range of people. This book can be seen as a restatement for our time of that one timeless spiritual teaching, the essence of all religions. It is not derived from external sources, but from the one true source within, so it contains no theory or speculation. I speak from inner experience, and if at times I speak forcefully, it is to cut through heavy layers of mental resistance and to reach that place within you where you already know, just as I know, and where the truth is recognized when it is heard. There is then a feeling of exaltation and heightened aliveness, as something within you says, Yes, I know this is true. Chapter 1 You are not your mind. Enlightenment, what is that? A beggar had been sitting by the side of a road for over thirty years. One day a stranger walked by. Spare some change, mumbled the beggar, mechanically holding out his old baseball cap. I have nothing to give you, said the stranger. Then he asked, What's that you're sitting on? Nothing, replied the beggar, just an old box. I've been sitting on it for as long as I can remember. Ever looked inside? asked the stranger. No, said the beggar. What's the point? There's nothing in there. Have a look inside, insisted the stranger. The beggar managed to pry open the lid. With astonishment, disbelief and elation, he saw that the box was filled with gold. The Power of Now, A Guide to Spiritual Enlightenment by Eckhart Tolle Published by Namaste Publishing and New World Library, Nevada, California You are here to enable the divine purpose of the universe to unfold. That is how important you are. Hello, I'm Connie Kello, the publisher of The Power of Now in Canada. And I'm sitting here with Eckhart Tolle, spiritual teacher and the author of The Power of Now. Next to me also is Mark Allen, our American publisher, who is responsible for the release of this audio version of the book. Like me, Mark recognized Eckhart for the profound spiritual teacher he is. And this book for the powerful and pure teaching it is. We were both literally compelled to publish The Power of Now, to put it out into our world. And now the three of us join together in love to do this audio version of the book. We'll now begin with Eckhart reading the introduction. I have little use for the past and rarely think about it. However, I would briefly like to tell you how I came to be a spiritual teacher and how this book came into existence. Until my thirtieth year, I lived in a state of almost continuous anxiety, interspersed with periods of suicidal depression. It feels now as if I'm talking about some past lifetime or somebody else's life. One night, not long after my 29th birthday, I woke up in the early hours with a feeling of absolute dread. I had woken up with such a feeling many times before, but this time it was more intense than it had ever been. The silence of the night, the vague outlines of the furniture in the dark room, the distant noise of a passing train, everything felt so alien, so hostile, and so utterly meaningless that it created in me a deep loathing of the world. The most loathsome thing of all, however, 
was my own existence. What was the point in continuing to live with this burden of misery? Why carry on with this continuous struggle? None of us had the slightest idea of the sinister meaning behind that little movement of a man's finger, pointing now to the right and now to the left, but far more frequently to the left. It was my turn. Somebody whispered to me that to be sent to the right side would mean work, the way to the left being for the sick and those incapable of work who would be sent to a special camp. I just waited for things to take their course, the first of many such times to come. My haversack weighed me down a bit to the left, but I made an effort to walk upright. The SS man looked me over, appeared to hesitate, then put both his hands on my shoulders. I tried very hard to look smart, and he turned my shoulders very slowly until I faced right, and I moved over to that side. The significance of the finger game was explained to us in the evening. It was the first selection, the first verdict made on our existence or non-existence. For the great majority of our transport, about 90%, it meant death. Their sentence was carried out within the next few hours. Those who were sent to the left were marched from the station straight to the crematorium. This building, as I was told by someone who worked there, had the word bath written over its doors in several European languages. On entering, each prisoner was handed a piece of soap, and then... But mercifully, I do not need to describe the events which followed. Many accounts have been written about this horror. We who were saved, the minority of our transport, found out the truth in the evening. I inquired from prisoners who had been there for some time where my colleague and friend P had been sent. Was he sent to the left side? Yes, I replied. Then you can see him there, I was told. Where? A hand pointed to the chimney a few hundred yards off, which was sending a column of flame up into the grey sky of Poland. It dissolved into a sinister cloud of smoke. That's where your friend is. Floating up to heaven, was the answer. But I still did not understand until the truth was explained to me in plain words. But I am telling things out of their turn. From a psychological point of view, we had a long, long way in front of us from the break of that dawn at the station until our first night's rest at the camp. They took charge of the new arrivals and their luggage, including scarce items and smuggled jewellery. Auschwitz must have been a strange spot in this Europe of the last years of the war. There must have been unique treasures of gold and silver, platinum and diamonds, not only in the huge storehouses, but also in the hands of the SS. 1,500 captives were cooped up in a shed, built to accommodate probably 200 at the most. We were cold and hungry, and there was not enough room for everyone to squat on the bare ground, let alone to lie down. One five-ounce piece of bread was our only food in four days. Yet I heard the senior prisoners in charge of the shed bargain with one member of the receiving party about a tie-pin made of platinum and diamonds. Most of the profits would eventually be traded for liquor, schnapps. I do not remember any more just how many thousands of marks were needed to purchase the quantity of schnapps required for a gay evening but I do know that those long-term prisoners needed schnapps. Under such conditions, who could blame them for trying to dope themselves? There was another group of prisoners who got liquor supplied in almost unlimited quantities by the SS. These were the men who were employed in the gas chambers and crematoriums, and who knew very well that one day they would be relieved by a new shift of men, and that they would have to leave their enforced role of executioner and become victims themselves. Nearly everyone in our transport lived under the illusion that he would be reprieved, that everything would yet be well. We did not realize the meaning behind the scene that was to follow presently. We were told to leave our luggage in the train and to fall into two lines, women on one side, men on the other, in order to file past a senior SS officer. Surprisingly enough, I had the courage to hide my haversack under my coat. My line filed past the officer man by man. I realized that it would be dangerous if the officer spotted my bag. He would at least knock me down. I knew that from previous experience. Instinctively, I straightened on approaching the officer, 
so that he would not notice my heavy load. Then I was face to face with him. He was a tall man who looked slim and fit in his spotless uniform. What a contrast to us, who were untidy and grimy after our long journey. He had assumed an attitude of careless ease, supporting his right elbow with his left hand. His right hand was lifted, and with the forefinger of that hand he pointed very leisurely to the right or to the left. Escorted by SS guards with loaded guns, we were made to run from the station, past electrically charged barbed wire, through the camp to the cleansing station. For those of us who had passed the first selection, this was a real bath. Again, our illusion of reprieve found confirmation. The SS men seemed almost charming. Soon we found out their reason. They were nice to us as long as they saw watches on our wrists, and could persuade us in well-meaning tones to hand them over. Would we not have to hand over all our possessions anyway? And why should not that relatively nice person have the watch? Maybe one day he would do one a good turn. We waited in a shed, which seemed to be the anteroom to the disinfecting chamber. SS men appeared and spread out blankets, into which we had to throw all our possessions, all our watches and jewellery. There were still naive prisoners among us who asked, to the amusement of the more seasoned ones, who were there as helpers, if they could not keep a wedding ring, a medal or a good luck piece. No one could yet grasp the fact that everything would be taken away. I tried to take one of the old prisoners into my confidence. Approaching him furtively, I pointed to the roll of paper in the inner pocket of my coat and said, Look, this is the manuscript of a scientific book. I know what you will say, that I should be grateful to escape with my life, that that should be all I can expect of fate. But I cannot help myself. I must keep this manuscript at all costs. It contains my life's work. Do you understand that? Yes, he was beginning to understand. A grin spread slowly over his face, first piteous, then more amused, mocking, insulting, until he bellowed one word at me in answer to my question, a word that was ever present in the vocabulary of the camp inmates. Shit. At that moment I saw the plain truth, and did what marked the culminating point of the first phase of my psychological reaction. I struck out my whole former life. With the progressive dawn, the outlines of an immense camp became visible. Long stretches of several rows of barbed wire fences, watchtowers, searchlights and long columns of ragged human figures, grey in the greyness of dawn, trekking along the straight desolate roads to what destination we did not know. There were isolated shouts and whistles of command. We did not know their meaning. My imagination led me to see gallows with people dangling on them. I was horrified, but this was just as well, because step by step we had to become accustomed to a terrible and immense horror. Eventually we moved into the station. The initial silence was interrupted by shouted commands. We were to hear those rough, shrill tones from then on over and over again in all the camps. Their sound was almost like the last cry of a victim, and yet there was a difference. It had a rasping hoarseness, as if it came from the throat of a man who had to keep shouting like that, a man who was being murdered again and again. The carriage doors were flung open, and a small detachment of prisoners stormed inside. They wore striped uniforms, their heads were shaved, but they looked well fed. They spoke in every possible European tongue, and all with a certain amount of humour, which sounded grotesque under the circumstances. Like a drowning man clutching a straw, my inborn optimism, which has often controlled my feelings even in the most desperate situations, clung to this thought. These prisoners look quite well. They seem to be in good spirits and even laugh. Who knows, I might manage to share their favourable position. In psychiatry, there is a certain condition known as delusion of reprieve. The condemned man, immediately before his execution, gets the illusion that he might be reprieved at the very last minute. We too clung to shreds of hope, and believed to the last moment that it would not be so bad. Just the sight of the red cheeks and round faces of those prisoners was a great encouragement. Little did we know then that they formed a specially chosen elite, 
who for years had been the receiving squad for new transports as they rolled into the station day after day. Sometimes, in the process of writing, an entirely new answer came that was more profound or insightful than anything I'd ever uttered. Some additional questions were asked by the editor so as to provide further clarification of certain points. You will find that from the first to the last page, the dialogues continuously alternate between two different levels. On one level, I draw your attention to what is false in you. I speak of the nature of human unconsciousness and dysfunction as well as its most common behavioral manifestations. From conflict in relationships to warfare between tribes and nations. Such knowledge is vital, for unless you learn to recognize the false as false, as not you, there can be no lasting transformation, and you would always end up being drawn back into illusion and into some form of pain. On this level, I also show you how not to make that which is false in you into a self and into a personal problem, for that is how the false perpetuates itself. On another level, I speak of a profound transformation of human consciousness, not as a distant future possibility, but available now, no matter who or where you are. You are shown how to free yourself from enslavement to the mind, enter into this enlightened state of consciousness and sustain it in everyday life. On this level of the book, the words are not always concerned with information, but often designed to draw you into this new consciousness as you listen. Again and again, I endeavor to take you with me into that timeless state of intense conscious presence in the now, so as to give you a taste of enlightenment. Until you are able to experience what I speak of, you may find those passages somewhat repetitive. As soon as you do, however, I believe you will realize that they contain a great deal of spiritual power, and they may become for you the most rewarding parts of the book. Moreover, since every person carries the seed of enlightenment within, I often address myself to the knower in you who dwells behind the thinker, the deeper self that immediately recognizes spiritual truth, resonates with it, and gains strength from it. As you listen, the meaning of certain words, such as being or presence, may not be entirely clear to you at first. Just keep listening. Questions or objections may occasionally come into your mind. They will probably be answered later in the book, or they may turn out to be irrelevant as you go more deeply into the teaching and into yourself. Don't listen with the mind only. Watch for any feeling response as you read and a sense of recognition from deep within. I cannot tell you any spiritual truths that deep within you don't know already. All I can do is remind you of what you have forgotten. Living knowledge, ancient and yet ever new, is then activated and released from within every cell of your body. The mind always wants to categorize and compare, but this book will work better for you if you do not attempt to compare its terminology with that of other teachings. Otherwise, you will probably become confused. I could feel that a deep longing for annihilation, for non-existence, was now becoming much stronger than the instinctive desire to continue to live. I cannot live with myself any longer. This was a thought that kept repeating itself in my mind. Then suddenly I became aware of what a peculiar thought it was. Am I one or two? If I cannot live with myself, there must be two of me, the I and the self that I cannot live with. Maybe, I thought, only one of them is real. I was so stunned by this strange realization that my mind stopped. I was fully conscious, but there were no more thoughts. Then I felt drawn into what seemed like a vortex of energy. It was a slow movement at first and then accelerated. I was gripped by an intense fear and my body started to shake. I heard the words, resist nothing, as if spoken inside my chest. 
I could feel myself being sucked into a void. It felt as if the void was inside myself rather than outside. Suddenly, there was no more fear, and I let myself fall into that void. I have no recollection of what happened after that. I was awakened by the chirping of a bird outside the window. I had never heard such a sound before. My eyes were still closed and I saw the image of a precious diamond. Yes, if a diamond could make a sound, this is what it would be like. I opened my eyes. The first light of dawn was filtering through the curtains. Without any thought, I felt, I knew, that there's infinitely more to light than we realize. That soft luminosity filtering through the curtains was love itself. Tears came into my eyes. I got up and walked around the room. I recognized the room, and yet I knew that I had never truly seen it before. Everything was fresh and pristine, as if it had just come into existence. I picked up things, a pencil, an empty bottle, marveling at the beauty and aliveness of it all. That day I walked around the city in utter amazement at the miracle of life on earth, as if I had just been born into this world. For the next five months, I lived in a state of uninterrupted deep peace and bliss. After that, it diminished somewhat in intensity, or perhaps it just seemed to because it became a natural state. I could still function in the world, although I realized that nothing I ever did could possibly add anything to what I already had. I knew, of course, that something profoundly significant had happened to me, but I didn't understand it at all. It wasn't until several years later, after I had read spiritual texts and spent time with spiritual teachers, that I realized that what everybody was looking for had already happened to me. I understood that the intense pressure of suffering that night must have forced my consciousness to withdraw from its identification with the unhappy and deeply fearful self, which is ultimately a fiction of the mind. This withdrawal must have been so complete that this false suffering self immediately collapsed, just as if a plug had been pulled out of an inflatable toy. I am that stranger who has nothing to give you and who is telling you to look inside. Not inside any box as in the parable, but somewhere even closer, inside yourself. But I'm not a beggar, I can hear you say. Those who have not found their true wealth, which is the radiant joy of being and the deep, unshakable peace that comes with it, are beggars, even if they have great material wealth. They are looking outside for scraps of pleasure or fulfillment, for validation, security or love, while they have a treasure within that not only includes all those things, but is infinitely greater than anything the world can offer. The word enlightenment conjures up the idea of some superhuman accomplishment, and the ego likes to keep it that way. But it is simply your natural state of felt oneness with being. It is a state of connectedness with something immeasurable and indestructible. Something that, almost paradoxically, is essentially you and yet is much greater than you. It is finding your true nature beyond name and form. The inability to feel this connectedness gives rise to the illusion of separation from yourself and from the world around you. You then perceive yourself, consciously or unconsciously, as an isolated fragment. Fear arises and conflict within and without becomes the norm. I love the Buddha's simple definition of enlightenment as the end of suffering. There's nothing superhuman in that, is there? Of course, as a definition, it is incomplete. It only tells you what enlightenment is not. No suffering. 
but what's left when there's no more suffering. The Buddha is silent on that and his silence implies that you will have to find out for yourself. He uses a negative definition so that the mind cannot make it into something to believe in or into a superhuman accomplishment, a goal that is impossible for you to attain. Despite this precaution, the majority of Buddhists still believe that enlightenment is for the Buddha, not for them, at least not in this lifetime. You used the word being. Can you explain what you mean by that? Being is the eternal, ever-present one life beyond the myriad forms of life that are subject to birth and death. However, being is not only beyond, but also deep within every form, as its innermost invisible and indestructible essence.